Hi, my name is Allison, and I am Director of Education at the National First Ladies Library. Welcome to our latest installment of Fun with Flotus. The last time we met, we talked about two different women who ran for President of the United States. One was Shirley Chisholm, and the other was Victoria Woodhull. Today, we're going to talk about one more woman who not only ran for president, but she was the very first woman lawyer to argue a case before the Supreme Court. Her name was Belva Lockwood, and she's a pretty cool woman. We're going to read a story today called Ballots for Belva, the true story of a woman's race for the presidency by Sudipa Bardham Quellen and illustrated by Courtney A. Martin. When Belva Lockwood was 10 years old, she read that with a little bit of faith, anyone could move a mountain. She took the words literally. Of course, Belva didn't try to move a whole mountain. After all, she was just a child. A hill seemed so much more appropriate. She scouted around until she found the perfect one. She picked out a small hill outside her house and concentrated all of her willpower on moving it. She had faith in herself and she was determined to move that hill, even it was just the tiniest little bit. But the hill stayed put, but Belva never stopped trying to move mountains. Belva was born on a farm in Niagara County, New York in 1830. She was the second of five children, and she described herself as a simple country girl and the daughter of a poor farmer. But humble beginnings didn't stop Belva from aiming high. Years after the mountain moving incident, after getting married, having a daughter, being widowed, graduating from college, working as a teacher, starting a suffrage group, and marrying again, Belva decided she wanted to be a lawyer. She was 39 years old, smart, spirited, and willing to work hard, but no law school would admit her. One said, Mrs. Belva A. Lockwood, Madam, the faculty of Columbian College have considered your request to be admitted to the law department of this institution, and after due consultation, have considered that such admission would not be expedient as it would be likely to distract the attention of the young men. Two other law schools never even responded to her application. A mountain was blocking the way to her dream. Belva set about to move the mountain, and this time she wasn't going to fail. Belva heard about the newly formed National University Law School, where the school director claimed that they wanted to open their doors to women alongside men. They invited Belva to attend the classes, along with 14 other women, but the school didn't make things easy for the women. They weren't allowed to go to the same classes as the men or take their exams in the same room. Many of the men at the school didn't want any women studying with them and they weren't afraid to show it. They grumbled to school officials that they wouldn't go to school with women. 12 of the women dropped out of law school. It was just too hard to manage the pressures of school and the hostility from the other classmates. Balva was one of the only two women to finish the coursework. And after all that hard work, and though the women did everything the men did, the law school wouldn't give the women their diplomas. But Belva wasn't about to give up. On September 3rd, 1873, she wrote a letter to Ulysses S. Grant, who was both president of the United States and president of National University Law School. To His Excellency U.S. Grant, President USA, Sir, you are or are you not president of the National University Law School? If you are its president, I desire to say to you that I have passed through the curriculum of study in this school and I am entitled to and demand my diploma. If you are not its president, then I ask that you take your name from its papers and not hold out to the world to be what you are not. Very respectfully, Belva A. Lockwood. A few days later, Belva got her diploma, signed by the president himself. 
she was now a lawyer. She moved that mountain right out of her way and she learned an important lesson that she could accomplish anything she wanted with, in her words, willpower and mental effort combined with indefatigable labor. She knew that she would never stop believing, never stop thinking, and never give up. Again and again, Belva showed the world what she could do. And when she did something, others followed in her footsteps. She was already the first woman to graduate from National University Law School. Over the years, Belva also became the first woman to practice law in federal courts and the first to argue a case before the Supreme Court of the United States. Within a year of earning this right, Belva helped a Black attorney, Samuel R. Lowry, gain the same privilege. She believed as strongly in Lowry's equality before the law as she had believed in her own. Belva was a respected and influential lobbyist, public speaker, and activist for women's rights. She was also the first to ride around Washington, D.C. on a tricycle, an early type of bicycle with three wheels, very efficiently too, since she could speed along at 10 miles an hour. Within two or three years of Belva's tricycle debut, so many women were following her lead that the New York Times wrote, now a woman on a tricycle attracts no more attention than a woman on a horse. In 1884, at the age of 45, Belva was first once again. She became the first woman to officially run for president. At that time, women couldn't even vote. Belva had been working for many years to get laws passed to change that. She went to two Republican conventions in 1880 and 1884, trying to convince the Republican party to make women's suffrage a part of its official platform. Both times, Belva was ignored. Belva was so frustrated that she wrote to the Women's Herald of Industry, why not nominate women for important places? It is quite time we had our own party, our own platform, and our own nominees. We shall never have equal rights until we take them, nor respect until we command it. Belva realized that though women couldn't participate in elections by voting, there was nothing in the law that prevented them from running for office. I cannot vote, she said, but I can be voted for. So that's what Belva decided to do. In August, 1884, Belva received a letter from the Equal Rights Party of the United States that said, Madam, we have the honor to inform you that you were nominated at the Women's National Equal Rights Convention for President of the United States. Belva was shocked and surprised and initially kept the letter a secret, but on September 3rd, she wrote back to accept the nomination. Her campaign began. Belva selected another woman, Marietta Stowe, to be her running mate. Democrat Grover Cleveland and Republican James Blaine were Belva's main opponents. The campaign would be difficult. It was very expensive to run for president, to travel across the country to campaign, and to make the campaign a full-time job, especially without the backing of a well-funded political party. In 1872, a woman named Victoria Woodhall had announced that she would run for president, but her campaign was suspended before election day because she didn't have the money to continue. In those days, there were no state provided ballots that listed all the candidates' names. Instead, every political party had to print and distribute its own ballots, meaning that the candidates or parties that didn't have enough money to print ballots couldn't get any votes. Belva had worked on presidential campaigns in the past, so she knew what needed to be done. She worked hard to raise money for her campaign by giving speeches all over the country, and she organized her supporters to get ballots ready. Belva thought it would be a lively campaign, even though she knew there was a massive mountain between her and the White House. By now, you know that mountains wouldn't stop Belva Lockwood. 
Velva didn't stop when the newspapers called her campaign the most laughable masquerade the city has ever witnessed. She didn't stop when male critics organized Velva Lockwood parades where they dressed in women's clothing and pretended to be her. She didn't even stop when she ran into trouble in places she didn't expect. She had spent most of her life working for women's rights. In fact, she was running for president in part to convince people that women should be able to vote. But many women opposed her run for president. Some women thought she was crazy to try to force herself into what most people considered a man's world. Others who believed in women's rights as deeply as Belva did thought she was making a spectacle of herself and was making a joke out of the fight for women's rights. The National Women's Suffrage Association, the most important women's rights group, told Belva it would not support her run for president. In fact, one suffrage leader, Abigail Dunaway, said the damage done by her cannot be estimated. But Belva still had her faith. She knew she was doing something important. If nothing else, people were listening when she spoke and Belva spoke about all things that were important to her. In speech after speech across the nation, she told audiences that all Americans deserved equal rights, regardless of their race or gender. People listened. Quite a few people, in fact. The editors at the Washington Evening Star eventually wrote that it is evident that Mrs. Lockwood, if elected, will have a policy which will commend itself to all people of common sense. On election day, Belva didn't have much to do. After all, she couldn't go to the polls and cast a vote, not even for herself. She waited in her Washington DC home, opening it to any reporters who wished to interview her. She and the nation learned that Grover Cleveland won the election, but, Belva won votes. Belva didn't win just a few votes. She won 4,711 popular votes, cast in nine out of 38 states that existed at the time. And those were only the ones that were counted. There were more votes for Belva, especially in Pennsylvania, but those were thrown away because the vote counters couldn't believe that anyone would actually vote for a woman. Just when it looked like Belva had accomplished what she had set out to do, after the election, she found out that a good number of her votes were thrown away. She also learned that in some cases, her votes had been given away to other candidates. In fact, many of Belva's votes from the state of New York, a total of 1,336 were counted for Grover Cleveland. Cleveland won the state by only 1,149 votes, and Belva wondered what would happen if her votes hadn't been miscounted. She petitioned Congress about voting practices in January 1885. She said that because the government did not control the ballots printed for an election or properly oversee polling places, people could easily stuff ballot boxes with fake votes or destroy or not count votes that had been legally cast. It didn't do much good. Congress didn't change the vote tallies. But Belva knew that whether Congress accepted her candidacy or not, she had moved that mountain as far as it would go at the time. Belva had become the first woman who ran for president who actually got people, men, since they were the only ones voting, to cast their ballots for her. She was the first woman to prove that Americans were willing to consider a female president. Belva believed that someday a woman would become president of the United States. She said, if a woman demonstrates that, it, that she is fitted to be president, she will someday occupy the White House. It will be entirely on her own merits, however. No movement can place her there simply because she is a woman. It will only come if she proves herself mentally fit for the position. When it was time, the mountain would move all the way, and Belva had given it a huge push. All it took was willpower and mental effort 
combined with indefatigable labor and Belva's determination to show the world what a woman can do. So that's our story today about another woman who helped move mountains to break that potential glass ceiling that has kept women from becoming president of the United States all of this time. So we have at a special link below some activities that you can do inspired by Belva Lockwood. So you can take a look at a special ribbon that was created as part of her campaign and create your own rebus inspired by that ribbon. It uses different icons to spell out Belva's name. We also look at some political cartoons because there are always a lot of political cartoons about women candidates, especially Belva. And she had a great sense of humor, so she didn't let them keep her from moving her mountains, right? So there are all sorts of activities you can do to think about Belva and some of the things she did to contribute to moving women further ahead in the world. So thanks so much for joining us for this installment of Fun with Flotus and let us know what you think. We'll see you next time. Thank you.